Chapter 18 I dreamed of an apple, a shiny green one. The sweetness of it was in my mouth and the juice ran down my chin. I opened my eyes. Patch and I lay in a tangle of old coats with bits of straw covering us. Anna stood next to the bed with an apple in her hand. Still a dream, I thought. But this apple wasn't shiny green. It was wrinkled and almost as gray as the cloth that was tucked up under my chin. An apple? Where did you get that? I leaned up on one elbow with Patch reached across me. Anna was almost smiling. I saved it. She put it in his hand. We sat on the edge of her bed, Patch and I taking turns. I held it out to Anna once and then a second time, but she shook her head and motioned for us to eat. We ate until it was finished. Core gone, seeds gone, everything gone even the stem, and Anna watched, nodding. We lay back against the straw, wishing for something else to put in our mouths, wishing for another apple. Patch began to whimper. I put my hand on his arm to stop him from saying what I wanted to say myself. He said it anyway. Do you have another apple, Anna, please? She touched his soft hair. I finished the shawl during the night, she said. The wool is good and the stitches are fine and even. Oh, Anna, I said, and I swung my legs out of the straw. I will go to Ballylee with it to sell. I sat at the edge for a moment. It was a long walk, and I felt shaky even after the apple. Patch struggled up out of the straw. I'll go with you, Nori. Anna grabbed my wrist. Be careful, she said sharply. Don't let strangers see you with any money. Spend it wisely, but only what's necessary. She looked angrier than I had ever seen her, but I knew it wasn't anger. The lines and furrows in her face had to do with worry. I will be careful, I said. I will buy what we need and then come back. Will you take care of the little one, she said. I nodded. No, Patch began to cry. We'll buy a penny bun. I swooped down to give him a hug, but he didn't stop to tell him that he couldn't go with me. I just went, listening to his crying. It was a beautiful day. The sea laid out flat and gray, and in back of me the sun coming up over the cliffs. I walked slowly, the shawl hidden under my petticoat. But no one was on the path this morning. Scavengers were at the water's edge where nothing would wash up. The land was bare as well. Even the grass was sparse because people had pulled up huge clumps to suck on. Nothing else grew except the razor-sharp seagrass on the sand dunes near the water. I kept walking, planning. How much would I get for the shawl? Whom would I sell it to? What was the most important thing to buy afterward? And I thought of the package in the post office. I reached the main street at last. People filled the street, people with no money for a shawl, no money for food. They stood in front of the bakery, waiting, coughing, holding each other up. Others were at the hotel, hands out, swaying a little. Their eyes were huge in their bony faces, and even though the day was cold, some of them were almost no clothing, just pieces of rags. One woman had only her petticoat. They must have sold whatever they could, I thought, to buy a bit of food. I pushed through them to the door of the hotel, and I waited too looking through the lobby window. Inside, women were sitting in front of the hearth. One of them wore a ribboned hat that dipped and bobbed as she spoke. The woman with a brooch and ring sparkled in as she moved, Lord Cunningham's wife. She was holding a thick piece of brack to her mouth, but a man guarded the doors. He was so big I'd never be able to pass him. I held up the shawl so people around me couldn't see it, but I hoped the woman in the hat did. I stood there for a long time, watching her take delicate bites of the brack, wondering how it must be to have so much food. At last, she wiped her buttery fingers on a piece of cloth and turned toward me. She looked at the shawl, then motioned to the guard. He opened the door just enough to take the shawl for her. The woman held it up, feeling the ribs of it, running one finger over the pattern. The hat bobbed once again. She reached into a small red purse and gave coins to the guard. I saw him put one in his pocket before he opened the door but he dropped three others into the palm of, them, of my hand. I took the steps down from the hotel, pushing my way between two women with babies and the children who were sitting in the street. I darted around the side of the hotel and sank down in a quiet spot. The coins were of different sizes. How much were they worth? I thought about bread or a handful of oats, but most of all I thought about the package that lay on the shelf in the post office. If I could have it in my hands, it would be better than a loaf of bread. It would be like having Maggie back with us in Maiden Bay. But Patch needed food more than a package. There might be anything or almost nothing. What would Maggie do? I stood up at last, feeling dizzy, hungrier than I had ever been, and started up the street, walking around the groups of people I had never seen so many before. Some of them lay against walls of the shops, looking as if they'd never get up. 
their eyes sunken in their heads. They were almost like skeletons, and it was quiet now, so quiet. I pulled my shawl over my mouth and made my way around them to the post office. The window was filthy. I peered through the dirt at the shelf with the box and the bits of colored paper and the R for Ryan. But Patch's face was in my mind and Anna's. Suppose there was no food in the box or nothing that could be turned into food. But there was something inside that Maggie thought we wanted or needed. What? I leaned against a piece of glass in the window to stop the pounding in my head. It was cool and I hated to move. But I went through the alley to the back of the baker with the coins tight in my hands. At the doorway, I held out one of the coins the way I had held out the shawl, covering it so only the baker could see what I was holding. After a while, he came back to the door, reached for the coin with his dusty white hands. He came back with a knob of flour and a twist of paper and a handful of oats in a small bag. What else could I buy? I hurried head down to the main street again with the package under my shawl. I had to find something that would last. A man holding a can blocked my way. It's milk, he said. The last from my cow before they took her away. He bit his lips, chapped as Celia's and mine were, but there was something about him. His eyes almost hidden under the straggly hair that made me think of Devlin. I took a step away. He followed me. The whole can for a coin. My headache was worse. I was dizzy, trying to think of what to do. Should I buy it? Would I spill the milk on the way home? It had a strange color, after all, almost like one of Biddy's eggs. I shook my head and took another step and another and backed into the doorway of the post office. I was dizzy, thinking of Maggie's face in front of me. She shook her head. No, Celia said, you never think of what you're doing. I should put this coin into Anna's hand. Instead, I put the coin on the counter. I couldn't even speak. I just pointed up. Somehow I knew Anna wouldn't mind. The postman looked down at the coin. He shook his head, so I put down the last coin. And then the package was in front of me and I was putting my N on a lined piece of paper to say that you received it, you know, he said. I went out the door holding it, weighing it in my mind, not heavy, not light. I ran my fingers over the bits of color, red and green in the writing. I could even pick out my own N and Celia's C as well as the R for Orion, but I didn't stop to open it. I took the narrow, twisting road that circled Maiden Bay and led toward home. Through my dizziness, I could still see us, the three of us, around Anna's hearth. We'd have a dollop of stir about each and enough flour for a tiny loaf of bread that would last us for days. And maybe by that time Celia and Granda would be back. And Da with coins in his pocket and I would tell him, Anna first. As I reached the top of the hill I saw her house below. My head was full of my packages and how I would put them on the table and what Anna would say and what Patch would do. I hardly felt the rain as it pelted down on me, covering the road and the rock's walls on each side. I hardly noticed the fog as it blotted out the cliffs. By the time I heard the footsteps, it was too late. I felt a hand on my back of my neck, felt a push. I threw my arms to stop myself from falling, but it didn't help. There was a sudden pain as I went down and a rock tore up in my forehead. I looked up to see the man running with my packages under his arm, his hair streaming out in back of him, his can of milk rolled down the hill, splashing milk as it went. I closed my eyes. I didn't want to see anything else. Celia was right. I didn't think. It seemed as if my eyes were closed for only a minute, even though it was dark when I opened them, and I lay in the straw of Anna's bed, shivering. Anna and Patch crouched on the floor next to me, both watching. Anna held up my head and poured something into my mouth, something bitter, foo-far, and even though I could hardly think, I knew the herb, comfrey. Nori's sick, Patch said, but Anna shook her head. Not sick, shocked. Something happened to her. The sound of a cloth being ripped, cool water on my head, the smell of confrey. I was asleep and then awake, listening to Patch ask for food. To Anna, as she made a soup for him and tucked him in beside me, still listening to Patch's breath slowed and thickened in sleep. Anna's hand was on my cheek. It's all right, she kept saying. It'll be all right. I opened my eyes once, and then, at last, I really slept.